Buying an existing business, adding value and selling it, I've always found a much easier path to take because, te I mean, technically the business is ready to sell the day that you bought it. It's just right. there might not be that much delta or upside in the... Uh, uh, you don't have to run the whole marathon. There's differences, yeah. <laughs> as I've said many times, you don't run the marathon, you run the last 10 yards, you yeah. still get the medal. The reason I didn't sell it, that it had the three-year contract with the world's largest insurance company, would have been a great reason for the buyer to buy it. Right. Um, you know, they would like to buy a company that has that kind of contract in place. So, the, so my, my reason for not selling it was the perfect reason to sell it. The two things entrepreneurs never have is time and capital. They're overworked, underpaid. Um, you give an entrepreneur time and capital, they can have a transformative impact on not only their own life, but the lives of people around them. Their next business, their next business can be something that has way more impact than the one that they started to try and solve the challenge of you know, wealth. So funnily enough, people ask me all the time, hey, what's it like in Dubai? And I said, I'll tell you when it's finished. <laughs> so, Welcome back to Technology for Change, our podcast for entrepreneurs uh, that are looking to make a change through technology. So this is season three, episode five, and uh, I'm joined by Jeremy Harbour. Thank you, Jeremy, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Perfect. Jeremy is the CEO and founder of the Unity Group and uh, a private equity firm which he leads and specializes in investments uh, and opportunities for small to mid-sized businesses. Um, it's very interesting to have him here because I've been following you as well myself. Uh, I'm a consumer for the Harbor Club. So it's interesting to kind of have you here to speak with other investor, uh, entrepreneurs and investors like mm -hmm. myself. Um, so I guess before we get into it, how would you tell us, like, how did you get started in acquisitions? Yeah, I think uh, it's an unusual path because most people uh, I come across either come through sort of investment banking, corporate finance, you know, legal, you know, one of those kind of channels. I did come through kind of startup entrepreneurship, which is uh, uh, un unusual to go across that that kind of barrier into that sort of uh, um, advisory world. And I mean, you know, you use the word private equity. I think that loosely describes what we do. But I mean, our, our tagline for years was really private equity because it was just me. Um, and uh, so we didn't really engage in, in the traditional sense. But my, my background was entrepreneurial. I did startups. Most of them failed. Um, one of them didn't. Um, <laughs> managed, to, uh, managed to sell that business. But on that journey towards an exit, um, we were in a very acquisitive industry. We were in telecoms in the 1990s uh, where everybody was buying everybody. And so you had to understand uh, M&A. You, I mean, you were either being bought or you were buying someone. And so every week, you know, my, my week was punctuated with these meetings with, uh, with people trying to buy me. And, um, and very quickly, I realized that I could be on the other side of the table. I could be the buyer instead of the seller particularly as most of them weren't going to give me any money up front for my business. So I, I was in that camp for sure. Um, and so I kind of pivoted pivoted to be an acquirer, acquired a handful of businesses and then sold that company and realized actually, you know, you don't make money running businesses you make when you sell them. Um, and the, the actual doing the deals was way more fun than running the business. So, um, you know, the staff and customers bit is is not so fun. The, uh, the buying and selling bit I really enjoyed. So it was really a question of, um, you know, when, when the dust settled after that uh, exit, looking at, you know, the, the, ple the sort of clean sheet of paper and saying, what do I enjoy? What should I do more of? And it was let's do more deals. And so I just started buying and selling companies. I wanted to preserve preserve capital. I wanted to be careful with, uh, you know, not throwing uh, uh, cash into what are very volatile assets, small to medium sized businesses. So I focused initially on distressed companies. It was, we came into the global financial crisis around then, so it was quite good timing. Um, focused on distressed businesses and focused on what I would describe as sort of asymmetric risk deal structures. So focused on deals where we could minimize our exposure upfront, but maximize the upside. So take away the downside, maximize the upside, I guess is the, the best description of, of asymmetric risk. Um, so uh, as, a, as a sort of side effect of that, I just started developing tools and tactics and methodologies for doing deals that had low upfront exposure. And the small to medium sized business space is a very unloved segment of the M&A 
space and nobody in the traditional M&A world really understands it because owner managers are entrepreneurs they're not dealing with bankers they're not dealing with advisors and so they really struggle to to get deals done so I guess our secret source is being able to deal with entrepreneurs because we are entrepreneurs that's that's a pretty extensive answer you kind of <laughs> answered a few other questions that I had but okay. let's let's kind of dive into the structure as you called it um, and the secret sauce that you created which is part of the Harbor Club now mm-hmm. right yeah um, so how long did it kind of take you to perfect it how many sort of um, times did you have to change it so so to speak like pivot yeah it's I guess it's a constant evolution because um, you know, when I first started out, it, you know, deals had to be distressed in order for me to make the deal work because I didn't have the confidence or the competence to get any other kind of deal to, to come together. They had to be, you know, if they weren't sitting there with a bottle of whiskey and a revolver, um, <laughs> I wasn't really going to be able to get that deal done. Um, and then as you get more proficient and and more knowledge and, and better at dealing with um, situations, you learn how to do, you know, different kinds of deals. And I, I guess, you know, the, the Harbour Club came about really because um, uh, I... I done a bunch of deals and people kept asking me to come work for them. So they wanted me to be a non-exec or they wanted me to be a consultant. And I I couldn't think of anything I would rather not do. I'd rather eat my feet than go and work for somebody having been an entrepreneur all my life. So none of that made uh, any sense. And then I actually bought a company that sold seminars. And I've always been kind of against the seminar industry. I I, wasted so many hours of my (laughs) life, um, you know, going to seminars where I thought I was going to learn something, but just ended up getting pitched, you know, some crazy masterminding course or some you know some next thing you had to buy in order to find out what you really wanted to learn and so I'd always been a bit anti-seminar but what it brought home to me was actually if you could do an anti-seminar if you could do the opposite of of the traditional seminar industry it would actually be very valuable to entrepreneurs and it'd be a great way of me imparting what I'd learned and and a lot of what I'd learned I wasn't going to use again because it was they were steps on the on the or rungs on the ladder Um, so I had all this knowledge around how to do distress deals but no appetite to do another distress deal then I had uh, you know all these ways that you could turn a business around which um, you know are useful but uh, again, I wasn't going into turnaround situations anymore. So the Harbour Club was also a great way of making sure that the experience and the knowledge that I'd built over the years was actually being put to good use by other people because I'd moved on to, you know, taking companies public IPOs, reverse mergers, reverse takeovers, you know, a, a completely different segment of the market. And I also share that experience with people on the on the Harbour Club as well. And it's a great way of um, of actually challenging your own thinking sometimes is when you have to teach somebody else how to do it or explain <laughs> to somebody else how to do it, it yeah. really makes you rationalize Better at it, yeah. yeah, all of the components of what it is you're actually makes doing. Sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So like you know, uh, about this part, which is the acquisition part, uh, I want to kind of um, touch on the exit part as well, mm-hmm. right? So you mentioned that you had your first startup and you made an exit, uh, successful exit from that, which is how you got started into the space. Um, tell us, like, when's the right time for an entrepreneur to kind of look, because you mentioned this earlier as well in one of your podcasts that it takes about two to three years sometimes to actually get an exit. Yeah, look, go- going from startup to exit is a slow is a slow process because, you um, you know, in all startups, there's the whole pushing the rock up the hill phase of, mm-hmm. of it where, you know, you, and you don't really recover that value. That's that's mm-hmm. kind of sunk time investment that goes yeah. into um, those businesses. But the business doesn't exist unless you unless you do that. Um, so buying an existing business, adding value and selling it, I've always found a much easier path to take because, te- I mean, technically the business is ready to sell the day that you bought it. It's just right. there might not be that much delta or upside in the uh, uh, you don't have to run the whole marathon there's differences yeah (laughs) as I've said many times you don't run the marathon you run the last 10 yards you still get the medal Um, so uh, why why do the 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 rest of the the marathon so the um, uh, but you know what I say to a lot of entrepreneurs is the right time to sell a business is now um, because you know a lot of the reasons that people give me for not selling their business now are exactly the reasons why they should sell it. So you know the the story I often tell is I had this call center business and we had a contract with the world's largest insurance company, um, and it was a three year contract and it spat off loads and loads of cash. And so my reasoning for not selling that business was that it had a three year contract with the world's largest insurance company. Now as it happened, the world's largest insurance company AIG went bust um, <laughs> and. And the contract became worthless and that business ultimately became uh, worthless. Um, now that's not to say I should have sold it because it went bust, but the reason I didn't sell it, that it had the three-year contract with the world's largest insurance company, would have been a great reason for the buyer to buy it. 
Right. Um, you know, they would like to buy a company that has that kind of contract in place. So, the, so my my reason for not selling it was the perfect reason to sell it. Um, but also, you know, you, you you see, you know, things can change in a moment. You know, uh, small businesses are a volatile asset. Um, mm-hmm. So you can have a pandemic, you can have a global financial crisis, you can have Amazon get into your marketplace, or you can have Google do it for free. Um, so you know, there are so many threats and changes and things. Uh, out there, and you know, businesses don't last forever. If you look at the S and P five hundred from the nineteen seventies, I think there's hard, you know twenty companies that are still in that <laughs> that, that are still in uh, you know in the S and P five hundred today. So the, there's you know so many companies come and go, uh, and everybody thinks everything is forever, um, but of course nothing is. So you, you do need to uh, yeah exit and and uh, move forwards. But would you? I, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of taking a bit of a pivot here. But uh, would you kind of think that? There are people that are more, you know, into business as a business or like, you know, think of Steve Jobs or mm-hmm. Elon Musk or people like that. Yeah. And there are people that are more into like creating new businesses or the entrepreneurship life cycle, not just yeah. scalability. But look, Elon Musk has the luxury to um, engage in his real passions because mm-hmm. he sold the business for mm-hmm. hundreds of millions of, of dollars. So it was an exit that basically put him on his path to be able to right. focus on the things that he really enjoys. Um, Steve Jobs um, took. Uh, Apple Public, which was a, a great capital event for him, he then went on and created Pixar, sold Pixar to Disney, had a you know became a billionaire in his own right, and could then come back and focus on his passion of turning Apple into what he really wanted it to right. uh, be. And in fact, if you look at most uh, entrepreneurs, there's a deal in there that was a game changer. So yeah, but you you've know, had like hundreds of deals, right? That's very different from two yeah, or three. Yeah, so right, rather than doing one one billion dollar uh, right. exit, yeah, I've done lots of smaller ones, but right. that, again, that was a a conscious choice that I think there's a view around entrepreneurship that you kind of have to build this massive thing and then sell it and so that stops people selling things for what can be life-changing sums of money and I would argue getting the life-changing sum of money earlier on in your career is much more valuable than waiting 20 years to see if it's worth a bit more Um, because it's kind of like um, the traditional approach to retirement which is that you have to work until you're broken and then you can stop working and be broken um and uh, and and, but uh, but that's when you're supposed to go out and enjoy your life and do all the things that you wish you'd done when you were uh younger and and it just seems like a a screwed up way to to think and i think the same thing gets applied to business which is you keep running that business until either you're broken or it's broken or it's worth billions and then you sell it whereas actually if you sold it for a, a couple of million or even half a million in your 20s that would have a transformational impact on your life. Having capital behind you. Look, the two things entrepreneurs never have is time and capital. They're overworked, underpaid. Um, you give an entrepreneur time and capital, they can have a transformative impact on not only their own life, but the lives of people around them. Their next business, their next business can be something that has way more impact than the one that they started to try and solve the challenge of you know, wealth uh, for themselves. And right. um, yeah, I, I just think people overlook the opportunity to get an earlier capital event that basically when you have capital you make better decisions you uh you have a lot more freedom you can yeah you can you can do a lot more when you have that cash behind you as long as you don't you know use it to pour into another business which is again a mistake i see all the time they sell their business and they pour it all into some startup um or they become an alcoholic get divorced buy a sports car you know the classic midlife crisis (laughs) kind of uh route or both so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's stick to the impact uh, yep. thing that you kind of mentioned, because um, in some of the podcasts that you kind of mentioned the impact that you want to have, mm-hmm. um, you know, where education is one critical part to what you uh, want to create, like mm-hmm. free education for everybody. And then um, you see entrepreneurship as a, a savior for the crisis of the world. Yeah. Can you sort of dive, you know, dive into what, uh, brought that on for you and then secondly um what you're doing about it right now. yeah it's this is going to be a long answer but the um <laughs> look uh, entrepreneurs are the change agents in society they're mm-hmm. the people that solve problems and come up with the creative solutions to just about all the problems that humanity has faced in its history and will no doubt solve all of the problems that it faces in its uh in its future mm-hmm. the problem is we don't empower entrepreneurs with wealth what you see is the ones that become wealthy do tend to then break through and do amazing things you know if you look at larry ellison and what he's done for cancer research um sean parker um created a 250 million uh, dollar um, uh, shared resource for cancer research that he then gave uh, gave away to the community. They reckon it's cut 50 years off of uh, of cancer research. 
Um, you've got Bill Gates. I know there's some controversy around some of the things that he does, but again, you know, has pretty much dedicated dedicated his life to philanthropy. Um, the Giving Pledge, you know, the richest people in the world all, all getting together and giving up at least half of their wealth to um, solve some of the world's greatest uh, challenges, you know, that um, Elon Musk trying to make us an interplanetary species, trying to solve climate change, you know, fo focusing on these really, really big audacious goals, but there's not enough of them. Um, there are entrepreneurs in every town, city, village um, that have uh, experienced problems in their own upbringing, whether it be homelessness, cancer, whatever it is, that can then go and solve those challenges on a local level and have a unique understanding of the communities that they exist in as well, which, which politicians can never do because politics is always so centralized they can't have this grassroots uh, sort of long tentacle approach into the into these local communities but small businesses are already there and they're already in those communities and they're already active the challenge that we have is that business activity and the hu you know humans have become detached from the financial world um, completely and so the analogy that I often use is that there are um, asset managers, um, funds, um, what are basically not, they're not people, they won't ever pay tax and they won't ever die. So this is things like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, all the Sovereign Wealth Funds, um, the Harvard Alumni Fund, the uh, religions, the Church of England has eight billion pounds under management, you know, in derivative stocks and bonds, eight, eight billion pounds, it will never die, it will never pay tax, it, uh, it will never have any impact in any of those local communities. Because what happens is money gravitates towards asset classes where they can demonstrate capital preservation, um, they can manage the risk profile, they have the scale to be able to deploy enough capital into, and they have liquidity so that the um, investors can, you know, move between asset classes. And so what's happened is banks have created perfect investment products, normally through derivatives. So if you look at if you look at all the different things you can invest in, stocks, bonds, et cetera, et cetera, derivatives come out at about 10 times global GDP. It's it's wow. uh, it's a huge amount of money. It's a one with 16 zeros on the end um, <laughs> for for the amount of derivatives that are available in the market. Now, right. this is this is synthetic financial instruments. Um, and if you look at the top 500 of these asset managers, which are, like I say, they don't die, they don't pay tax, the top 500 control $93 trillion of investment. So that's about 50 times the UK's GDP, and the UK is the fifth largest economy in the world. So um, this is an astonishing amount of money. If you then look at a pie chart of what they're invested in, you'll see they're in every asset class from real estate to stocks, bonds, all the usual suspects, you know, and, right. and a huge amount of derivatives. What's fascinating is that $93 trillion does not go anywhere near small to medium sized business. Now, if you then take all mature economies, so that's, you know, but that's US, a lot of risk, though, right? Like, that's a lot of risk for for these you know risk managers to well learn. yeah so let me yeah let me kind of go on to the next bit which is if you then look at small business if you go to any mature economy small business is 50 percent of gdp so half wow. the economic output comes from companies that employ less than 50 people wow. um, if you then look at the private sector employment um, in most countries, it's over 90% is in SMEs. So in the UK, it's something like 96% of uh, private sector workers work for small to medium sized businesses. So it's basically everybody. <laughs> um, it's such a large percentage of people that it, 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 you know nothing else really matters. So they pay all of the tax, they, uh, all the contribution to public services basically comes from small business because we know big businesses don't pay tax. They use international structures so they don't have to. Um, so fundamentally, you've got the small businesses with over 90% of the private sector workforce driving the entire tax and spend uh, situation. And yet they get the raw end of the deal on everything. They can't borrow money from banks. They can't get VC capital. They can't get private equity capital because they're too small. And they can't get this $93 trillion because they lack scale. They're too risky, um, as you said, uh, and they lack liquidity. If you invest in them, your money is stuck you know, forever. Or gone. So, yeah, so, so our basic principle was if we could make... Um, small business, an investable asset class, mm -hmm. then we could attract a fair allocation from that effectively dead money and get it back into every community, every town, every city, every village in the world, because that's where those entrepreneurs are. And that impact would then create wealth in all of those communities. Right. And then those entrepreneurs would go on and solve you know, the problems within uh, those communities. So it's, uh, we call it democratizing wealth. It's a way of driving that capital into every, uh, every community in the world. Um, and conceptually, the reason why 
though that money doesn't go into I mean by the way the, that top 500 asset managers an interesting statistic they have a greater allocation to Bitcoin than they do to small business <laughs> so small business is half of economic output and 90% of people of well. humans <laughs> and yet they have a bigger allocation to Bitcoin because Bitcoin they can manage the risk profile it's mm -hmm. got the scale they can deploy billions of dollars into it and it has liquidity they can sell it tomorrow if they buy it today and it's sexy and, yeah and uh, well it's it's just <laughs> it's an asset allocation that they have to have because it meets right. that criteria and exactly. um and small business doesn't give that so our idea was basically around um, creating clusters of small businesses we call them agglomerations but clusters of small businesses that that meet that criteria for investors so they have a manageable risk profile so they become a portfolio um, they're publicly listed so that they have you know transparency around their accounts and their activities um, and so uh, they, they can take a view on the risk of investing in that portfolio of, of small businesses um, the next one is they have scale so by putting a lot of small businesses together you arguably create a big business and therefore um, it can be allocated more capital and uh, and and uh, yeah it becomes more interesting to investors and then finally is liquidity uh, being listed on public markets means that they can invest in the morning and divest in the afternoon just like the s p 500 just like bitcoin and that liquidity makes it more attractive to institutional capital so our our goal for the last few years has been putting together uh, these groups of um, small businesses to effectively create um, uh, an asset class that should be investable for institutional capital. And we're still a long way to go. We're, we're nibbling around the edges at the moment, but that's the that's the big vision: is to democratize wealth by making small business an investable asset class. Well, okay. Well, so I, I was I was going to ask about agglomerate, which is something mm -hmm. that you kind of. Uh, created and, and trademarked uh, within the Harbor Club. Yeah. Um, so tell us about the community that you have in Harbor Club and, and how does that kind of play a role within the whole process of buying and selling and how does that help um, the whole process? Yeah, well, like I say, the Harbor Club is almost accidental. So um, back in kind of 2006, 7 and 8, I was being bugged all the time for to do consultancy work. And then when I bought this um, uh, seminar business, I decided to create the Harbour Club kind of seminar and community. And honestly, at the time, it was kind of a way of monetizing the information, feeling like it was a fair exchange of knowledge for money and, and being done with it. And what I noticed was in, I think it was 2009, I did 12 deals and 12 of the, uh, yeah, out of the 12 deals, all 12 of them had come from joint ventures I'd done with the early Harbour Club members and I suddenly realized actually there's a lot more power to the community than just uh, another education company or another training company. And so uh, we kind of pivoted the way that it worked into a community. And now we have, you know, a couple of thousand people all over the world in mainly the English speaking English law type countries. But we do have people in all sorts of uh, places. Um, and uh, uh, we have an app. We have lots of shared uh, information and documents and stuff that everybody, you know, shares. People share their deal stories. Um, we've recently started doing some live events called Deal Fest, um, which have gone down really, really well. We did one in the UK, one in Boston. We're doing one in uh, Phuket in Thailand uh, soon. Um, and basically, it's all case studies from Harbour Clubbers talking about deals that they've done, what they've learned, um, the all the war stories, um, good and bad. Um, and it's a three-day event and it's, it's hugely valuable because this is not necessarily my path because my path is going to be fairly unique in the way that I learned all this stuff on the go this is the story from members who've kind of uh, got the knowledge dump at the beginning and then what they went on and, and did with it so it's a, it's a really fascinating kind of um, yeah how they've it's fascinating to see how they've applied this knowledge and then um, yeah the stories that kind of have come out the uh, the other side of that perfect so, like, I'm sure that, you know, um, throughout the process, you've you've laid in the foundations and, and put together what you know and what you have so far. How does this all connect with with your vision and your goals? And what is what do your goals look like five years down the road or 10 years down the road? Yeah. So, look, um, the, the, the goal is around democratizing wealth. There are three components to that. One of them is entrepreneurship, which is the agglomeration model. And this idea I've kind of articulated around uh, making um, small business and investable asset class. Um, the second one you mentioned is education, um, and that's education in uh, mature economies. I mean, we saw during the pandemic that um, when you um, shut people at home, they could only last two weeks before they ran out of money. Um, in, a, in a developed country with
with yeah. an average you know salary per capita in the kind of thirty thousand dollars plus that shouldn't happen that's you know that's that's um terrible wealth planning um in a, in a right. lot of cases and and very simply solved i mean it's uh it really is about putting financial education at the heart of traditional education and and giving people proper life skills as opposed to um perhaps you know some of the crap Degrees they learn at yeah. school <laughs> yeah um, so uh um uh, and then, yeah, the final one is eradicating poverty. There are still some pockets of extreme poverty around the world where, you know, uh, and again, we shouldn't have this. There shouldn't be people in, you know, parts of India and China and Venezuela and places like that who literally cannot afford to eat, cannot afford to feed their um, children. Um, that It's astonishing that that still exists when there is so much uh, wealth around the world. Um, and it's not a, uh, necessarily a wealth redistribution kind of idea. It's it's more, it's again about empowering entrepreneurs to go and solve um, those problems and create opportunities in those uh, countries. But yeah, entrepreneurship, eradicating poverty and education are the, the kind of three key areas that um, that we want to focus on or engage in projects in, in each of those areas. And um, as far as we're concerned, continuing to agglomerate companies, take companies public and do more deals uh, is a great way of empowering entrepreneurs, making them wealthy um, and, and driving that vision forwards. That's pretty great. So this is a question that I should have probably asked when we started the interview, but I'm still curious. What brings you to Dubai? Uh, yeah, I moved here. I live here um, most of the year at the moment. So um, yeah, obviously the the summer is uh, it's not the, <laughs> the, be the best time to be here. So we normally uh, we're normally in Europe for the summer. Um, but uh, no, I lived in Singapore for twelve years, um, and uh, my kids were in school in Singapore. We were loving Singapore. Um, and then obviously during COVID, um, it became very tough out in Asia. Um, Asia took far stronger measures um, around what you could and couldn't do. Um, so we traveled in the middle of COVID, I think, uh, from speaking to other people now, apparently that was quite weird. But yeah, during, <laughs> 20, during 2020, we actually flew all over Europe. Um, so there was me, my wife, um, two kids. I've got a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and a little white dog. Um, that's one approach to vaccination, by the way. So what's that? Sorry, that's one approach to vaccination that you get all the strains. So you're right. Okay, <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, I see. We didn't even realize that. But yeah, no. So we we literally traveled from country to country all, right. th all through 2020. So um, went to all sorts of unusual places. Like Montenegro was open. So we spent a month in Montenegro. Oh. Very beautiful there. Um, and uh, yeah, just jumped around all over the place. In November, we came to Dubai, and I, 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 you may recall, November 2020, the whole world was shutting down. And Dubai was Dubai open. Was yeah. open. Yeah. yeah, and Dubai was, uh, you know, you could go to the restaurants, you could uh, enjoy yourself, you, uh, there was beach clubs, the weather's amazing in that time of year, you know, November is uh, the perfect climate uh, here. Um, and so we literally stuck the kids in school. Um, <laughs> Uh, paid their school fees and put them into school because I mean the term had technically started in September and it was November already so right. we figured it was uh, yeah we, we should do that at least um, and then we bought a house here it's uh, the property here is like 90% cheaper than Singapore so <laughs> buying a house is not a big decision here right. like it would be in Singapore um, and then um, it was kind of like a, I think initially it was like a two-year plan okay, okay let's buy a house here we'll stay here for two years when, when everything's calmed down we'll go back to Singapore type of idea and I think it was only about two or three months into that that we just thought, let's just stay here. It's <laughs> like um, the the time zone's great. So right. I do quite a bit of business in the US and Canada. And right. it was always horrible o'clock for someone. Like, uh, <laughs> I think, I think depending who, who had the upper hand in the deal was the person, you know, the other person had to get up at three in the morning or whatever. <laughs> so, um, so now that's no problem. You can do, you know, Zoom calls are much, much easier. Um, you know, travel's really easy. You're in the middle of the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, Asia's seven hours that way. America's seven hours that way. So um, from a, a travel perspective, it's, it's um, dead straightforward. Um, the summer's not that tolerable, but then uh, Europe is only tolerable in the summer, so it kind of it's the perfect balance to um, uh, to Europe. Um, and just in terms of you know being an entrepreneur, this is this is an entrepreneur's dream. This is um, you know this tax free. Should, it, well, it should well it's tax free, <laughs> but I mean look, it's very I mean it's very safe. You can have all the toys and all that sort of stuff. But no, I mean more like um, it shouldn't exist. You know, this is, an, <laughs> this is an example of making the impossible possible. Yeah, and what true. else do entrepreneurs do? And it was kind of one of the things I loved about Singapore was that they, there was this tiny island with no natural resources and yet they, they'd achieved so much. Right. And this is pretty much the, you know, the same deal. There, you know, 30 years ago, it was literally all desert and you're exactly. now in the most 
modern futuristic uh, city, in, city the in, in the world and and it shouldn't exist it shouldn't it shouldn't have worked it shouldn't yeah. be here and yet somebody incredibly brave and strong decided it was going to happen <laughs> and made it happen through sheer will and you know uh, and, it's and weird how, like it's, everywhere there's construction going on all yeah. the time so it's it's still well, growing like well so funnily enough people ask me all the time hey what's it like in dubai and i said i'll tell you when it's finished because <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's constant true. isn't it it's yeah. uh, yeah, nonstop. And and all the time you're thinking, you know, I remember when I first got here, we were like looking at property and like there's so much being built. You're kind of thinking, well, why would I buy a property now? There's, surely there's an oversupply. Surely there's, there's you know, too much uh, uh, coming onto the market. You know, there's a limited, a limited market for it. Since we bought our place, it's gone up like 40% and that's only like a year and a half. Um, yeah. So no matter how much they keep building, it doesn't seem to dilute the property market in any way. Yeah. Um, Demand supply doesn't work here. It's yeah, pretty weird. Yeah, economics. It's, uh, inverted economics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So let's kind of bring it back to our listeners who are uh, mostly entrepreneurs, people who are looking to start a business people who have a business or people that are looking to buy businesses um so on all these kind of three different types of um consumers mm -hmm. what would be your sort of uh checklist for them to get into your space yeah look i think um hey look it's not for everyone is the first thing so okay. i'm not saying my way is the right way or better than anyone else's or anything like that but yeah you I dropped say, out of school at 15 yeah. and started your first business i think that's but, but not normal look there's another engine on the plane that you might not know even exists and and this was a big eye-opener for me because when i was starting out i felt there were kind of three levers i could play around with one of them was my team and how you motivate them how you inspire them how you manage them and tons of books are written about that um, the next one I thought was marketing and how you brand yourself, how you position yourself, how you attract an audience to come to you. And um, shitload of books written about that. <laughs> um, and the other one is sales. Um, some companies just can't turn that positive feeling they give people into cash in the in the bank. And so, you know, selling is a skill that I think is really important for every entrepreneur, for every business to really uh, understand. And there's plenty of books written about that. And so when I started out, I just played with those three levers and I learned as much as I possibly could about those three levers. And then suddenly when people were coming out trying to buy my company, it was like this, uh, well, it was like peeking through the curtain, this whole other world on the other side of the curtain. <laughs> I never even knew was there, which is that you could buy a business. And right. when I bought my first company, we risked no capital. I mean, it was a tiny business, but we risked no capital and we grew by a year's worth of sales in an afternoon. Wow. And I'd been investing all this money in marketing things where, you know, the first few times it wouldn't work and then you'd get one that did work and it would work for a while. Then you'd have to change, <laughs> change it, it or again, pivot yeah. or whatever. And all of a sudden I just added a year's worth of revenue in an afternoon and it cost me nothing and I took no risk. Um, yeah. A dollar you bought that company a for? Dollar, I bought the company for a dollar yeah, or a pound as it was at the time. Um, and so this was like uh, an epiphany in mm -hmm. terms of, hang on a second, um, there's a completely different lever that I didn't even know knew exists. There's another engine on the plane that I haven't switched on yet. And, and I think it's really important because on, you know when you have an entrepreneurial business, there's an initial scaling period where you grow very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it naturally starts to plateau. Decline, and yeah. I think at that plateauing period, that's when you should add M&A to your repertoire or start to understand how you can grow the business through acquisition. Because it's the, it's the way to have that um, order of magnitude or meaningful you know, increase in the uh, uh, in, in the performance or growth of the of the business. And so, look, it's another rung on the entrepreneurial ladder. Um, it's important to understand. I think it's a great thing to learn about. The juice is worth the squeeze when you do a deal with uh, you know with a company. You, you have an order of magnitude impact on your life and your wealth. And I think right. having that uh, you know having that impact adds yeah tons and tons of uh, value in terms of you know acquisition should we look at uh, strategic gain as well as uh, value uh, in terms of revenue or? yeah I mean look I, I was I had this debate with my first team so the first team I had which was uh, you know a, a managing director a, a finance director and a sales director who worked for me um, they wanted to focus very much on strategic acquisitions where they could see the integration they could see how it was going to work mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do opportunistic stuff which was kind of like the fuck it if it's free why wouldn't we say yes <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like um, if it was a pub and it didn't cost me anything, right. why wouldn't I get into the pub business? You know, <laughs> um, and this was a constant debate we used to right. uh, used to have with them. And and in the end, I kind of got my own way. But um, 
No, you know, uh, I think I think you have a bit of both. So within our agglomerations, we have what we call strategic acquisitions, which are, you know, meaningful sized businesses that perhaps have some logical synergies with other companies in the group, uh, or they're the beginning of a new vertical that we can roll companies uh, underneath. And then we have what we call tactical acquisitions, which are opportunistic. So um, it might be a company that's got itself into financial trouble, so you can pick it up for for nothing and it just adds a load of customers or a new product or whatever to your business. It might be that um, it's a bit subscale, but it really fits with something else that you're doing. And so I, I think you have to have your eyes open to anything that comes along. I think if you set out and you say, it's got to be this size, this shape, this color, and if it's not that, I'm not interested, then you close yourself off to 80% of the opportunities that, that you know, could also have some impact or be valuable, or could even be a flip. You could buy it, fix it, and sell it, and create a capital event outside of your core business. So I think I think being open-minded is probably the, the way to approach it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's about, um, so one of, the, one of the things I often challenge people to do in the Harbour Club is to look at their diary, look at their calendar, and look at the meetings they have in their calendar and try and understand what kind of meetings they are. Are they having staff and customer related meetings, which means they're very much operational to their business, or are they having strategic kind of meetings, i.e. are they talking about joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, or exits? Because ultimately, once you've got through the startup phase, that first period where it's, you know, the fast growth and uh, everything's changing all the time, and you might have to completely change, even completely change the company name or what you sell, um, as often happens in in a dynamic startup situation. Once you've kind of got through that, all of the things that you used to do kind of become jobs for people. Mm-hmm. So you shouldn't be the person out marketing and selling the business. You shouldn't be doing the accounts. You shouldn't be doing you right. know, all, all of those things. What you should be doing is talking about joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, and exits, because they're the things that have that order of magnitude impact once you've got past the startup phase. Right, right, and, right. and many people never go through that transformation. They they stay in there and they're the person, they're the go-to person for everything in their business. And right. so then they're kind of stuck. It, it, you know, they often they created the business for time freedom, for financial freedom, and they've created a prison for themselves <laughs> <laughs> where they can't escape because they do everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, I can completely relate to that. Yeah, perfect. So I think um, in terms of uh, you know sort of concluding this, um, what's so assuming that a business wants to kind of uh, get into the space, um, are there books that you recommend? Is there a way for them to get into the Harbor Club? Uh, what are some of the steps that they can take? Yeah, I mean, look, we we deliberately pump out tons and tons of free content. And part of the reason for that is to kind of polarize the idea in people's minds because it's... Um, it's like Marmite, which most people won't understand because it's a very British thing, but you you either like it or you don't. And um, uh, so uh, we do a 21-day free uh, email course. We have the book, which is Go Do Deals. Actually, the URL for that is godo.deals, which I love as a a URL. (laughs) Um, uh, But uh, yeah, so we have the book, we have the 21-day email course, and we pump loads of stuff out on uh, on on YouTube so there's some really good AMA um, interviews there there's loads of interviews with harbor clubbers there's yeah all, all sorts of content people can you know dive down the the various rabbit holes to understand what it's about and I think that's the kind of starting point is just go through some of that and think is is this for you or is this something you just don't resonate with or fancy or or, or, or you know doesn't doesn't make any sense to you and and I think um yeah, it, it's a question of kind of taking that initial skim to right. see if it's something that resonates. I think that's one of the biggest uh, things for me as well when I went across your content because there's a lot of content out there for wealth creation and stuff, but it's all about like stocks and like mm-hmm. cars and assets and like all these kind of things, which, uh, you know, is is just so much that, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I really cannot really buy into it because like uh, getting a fixed asset or getting something which is, just gonna get you money where you don't do anything or you don't use your intelligence doesn't really resonate with me with you it's it's you're very specific on you know what you need to do how you need to get there because you've lived the life you've actually mm-hmm. been an entrepreneur started at 15 have filled startups uh, have a book written about it and have mm-hmm. a wealth of knowledge that you're putting out there so it's and you also interact with entrepreneurs day in day out so it's it's a lot of information that people can get from you mm-hmm. i would definitely recommend people uh to follow you and see some of your youtube content to get inspiration and if they're interested get in touch with monty or get in touch with some of your you know crew and uh, absolutely yeah. get signed yeah, up yeah. thank you so much for joining us um and uh, it was a pleasure for me and for the audience as well Wonderful. and hope to see you again yeah thank you for having me